absolutely certain they, you know, the common word is believe, right? But, you know, you can believe at a general level or you can believe with certain. When you're absolutely certain that if I do this, it's going to get that result and that result's going to change my life, you'll do it. When you think it absolutely is not going to work, you're never going to do it. The middle no man's land of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, that's the piece that kills people, right? So if it's a must for you, you got to make it work, right? In our case, right? That's an example. If it's not a must for you and you're not sure, you don't know what to do. So I, years ago, I'd look around and say, okay, how do people get themselves to follow through that haven't been following through? What's the difference? And I started interviewing hundreds of people, literally, and eventually thousands, because I had thousands of my events. So I'd ask the group to give me their feedback. And I came up with this model. It's like the holy grail of belief or the holy grail of momentum. It's like the difference between what makes the rich get richer and the poor get poor, right? And the difference we all know is mindset, but like, how is that built? So this is what I did. I created stupid little four little boxes, and I'll scribble it here for you. You think about the first thing that determines whether you can do something or not, and I put that in this first box at the top here on the left side, and it's potential. Like, what's the potential of a human being? Like, when you guys started, you proved something no one had done in history. You ran the four-minute mile, right? For golly knows how many centuries, they're trying to run a four-minute mile. Roger Bannister does it. How did he do it? Do you remember? You did it in this industry, right? You made a million bucks in a day. No one had ever done that in history, right? After you did it, a bunch of other guys are doing it because it became possible. Roger Bannister didn't just go physically practice. He made a shift in his head. He practiced in his head because he could never achieve it physically, so he had a change in his head first so that the result became certain enough he believed it and then his body got him through. After Roger Bannister ran that four-minute mile, within two years, 37 people ran a four-minute mile. It's amazing. Well, no one in history had ever done it. Now, here's how it works. The potential for anybody getting your product is extraordinary. They could do what you've done as much, more, or less. They can do whatever they want to do. The potential's there. The market's proven that. Whether or not they tap into potential has a lot to do with what action they take, which is the question you came to me with, right? Like, you know, God, they all have potential, but they're not taking action. And we all know that the action they take is going to determine the results they get. That's pretty obvious. So most people have a belief about what their real potential is no matter what you tell them. And that affects how much action they take. And of course that affects the result. And then ironically, that result reinforces their belief. And then that belief affects it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a person has unlimited potential, we all agree. But they take little action, little results, why? Because they have to start with a problem with their belief. They don't believe it's really going to happen for me. Maybe for Frank Kearns because he's got the cool hair and stuff. Or maybe it's for you because you're so driven, but it's not me. Maybe Tony Robbins because he's a freak, got these big teeth. Whatever their thought process <laughs> is, right? They got this thing, right? But what happens is if you believe that there's very little potential, how much action are you going to take? Nothing. Nothing, little. And when you take little potential with a little action, what kind of results do you get? Lousy little results. And when you get little results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you this was a waste of time. Sold you this wouldn't work. And then what happens? You tap even less potential. You take even less action. You get even worse results, and your belief gets even weaker. And this sucker feeds on itself until you are in a downward spiral. It's poisonous. It's poisonous, and it's self-fulfilling. Now, what if something could happen that could come along and fill you with a sense of absolute certainty? Not like I believe, but I mean where you know. In you guys' case, mine as well, we knew because we had to, because right. we burned the boats. There was no other option. We had to find a way. We'd had, we weren't going to live that way. We all did it in different ways and for different reasons, but in essence, that was it. If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find the way, and if this doesn't work, I will make the way, then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. When you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. I told you this thing would work out. Now you're even stronger. You tap more potential, take greater action, greater results. That's how you went from 300 bucks in a week to 2,500 in five days to 100,000 in a month to a million bucks in a day. Same thing with you. And we get momentum. That's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, some people go out and they go, well, I'm going to take a bunch of action. All right, I'm going to open this product. I'm going to try it. And they'll say to you, I even did it. But it's like a salesman who goes and knocks on the door and he knocks on 100 doors and says, you don't want one of these, do you? Yeah, exactly right. You know? And even if he doesn't say it verbally, his face says it because he doesn't believe it's going to work. So his voice, his body, the execution is so weak. Maybe if he talks to 100 people, somebody's going to buy out of pity. They don't want his kids to starve, right? But he's not going to get the result. So the core difference in people is how do you produce certainty when the world isn't giving it to you? You go out and you try and you try in your case, you're 100,000 in debt and nothing's working. 
how do you keep yourself going? The way you did it, the way I did it, the way you're doing it, we may not have done it consciously, is we didn't change our potential, that was there, and it wasn't even taking more action. Taking more action with a belief it's not gonna work, it's not gonna change anything. We got results in our head that made us feel certain as if it had already happened. True or false for you? True. Right? So give me an example so people know I'm not just making this crap up. Well, I mean, just like when I had nothing, I already knew I was driving like Ferraris and Porsches and stuff because I always wanted those cars. I right. already knew I was going to have them. It was inevitable. Right. I inevitably, you know, that was just my inevitable outcome. But how did you do that? Did you have a ritual? Did you think about it regularly? Was it one time you thought about it or was it something you had an obsession towards? I had an obsession towards it. I mean, yeah. I used to go, I used to work at a video store, which is the last job I ever had in my life. Thank God. And uh, I used to go to, to work almost every day and I used to bring two magazines with me to read on my breaks. Entrepreneur Magazine, just to read about business and everything yeah. else and read about what other people are doing, look for role models. And I used to carry an auto trader with me. And wow. I used to look at Porsches that were for sale. Yeah. And people always used to ask me, what are you doing with that Auto Trader magazine? I'm like, well, I'm just picking out the Porsche that I'm going to buy. Right. When I'm, Which probably got you a lot of crap. <laughs> I, I, I did. I, people made fun of me. Sure. I, I actually had a boss at that job tell me, you know, you really shouldn't do that to yourself, John, because it's, it's very, very likely that that is never going to happen. That it's very likely that you, you're never going to have that car. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of belief he was trying to put in my head. And I was like, no, you don't realize that it's, it's inevitable right. that I will drive here at sometime in the near future with that car when I'm not working for you right. and drop movies off for you to put back on the shelf. And was that it? actually happened. And it was one of the most oh, fulfilling days of my entire life. And the great thing was when I pulled up in this car, I was, well, you know, I was in my mid-20s, yeah. a car that most mid-20s... What know, kind of car people, was it? It was a Porsche 911 Turbo. It was sure. a convertible and everything. Sure. It was a beautiful car. It was one I... What out? Porsche. Yeah. When I always dreamed rocket. to have it. But, you know, for a few years, I always circled the ads of which ones I was going to buy. Well, when I finally got it and I pulled up at the store, you know, I had all these people, some people that were still working at this $7 an hour job were there years after I left. And I'll never forget this, even the boss and stuff, and, and the reaction of the people was like, wow, that is awesome. Yeah. Is that your dad's car? <laughs> and all I said to them was, not exactly. Good for and you. And I just smiled and just left. But it was, you know, I just... I, I, it's the weirdest thing, but I just knew it was going to happen. But you knew it because you I conditioned did, myself you to. You did it to over and over again. Was, yeah. When I was in high school, I was not a popular kid, but I was passionate and intense, and I'll never forget. Some people that give some particular girls gave me some crap, and a guy too. And I wrote in their journals or their, you know, their annual yearbook at the end. I wrote, you know, someday I said, you treated me like hell. Someday I'll be rich and famous, and you'll be an effing truck driver. And you'll be sitting there, I'll be with my rich, I'll be, be with this beautiful woman of my life, rich, and you'll be watching me on television thinking, you wish you would have treated me better. I actually wrote this shit in people's <laughs> annuals because I went to a 10 year high school reunion. <laughs> people <laughs> oh showed me God, this stuff, great. right? <laughs> but it's like, I burned the bridges, baby. I was like, there, this is how it's going to be. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. You know, they did studies, many have been done at this element, where they want to say, how much does the mind affect performance? So they take basketball. Now, I've worked with a lot of NBA players and turned them around. And, one of the problems many of them have is they'll choke on the free throw line. You know, well, everybody knows in that case, if you normally shoot really well and now you're not, something's interfering, something's getting in front of your state, some uncertainty, right, obviously. So they take a group and say, we're going to make them better. How do you make somebody better who's got this mental block? So they take a group of guys and they're going to do free throws and they do one group where they just practice for six weeks. Totally intense practice and I forget the number of free throws, but they got to do this many free throws every day. Take a second group and they have them not practice at all obvious. And they take a third group and they don't let them touch a basketball. All they do is have them practice in their mind, but the key is it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect, as corny as that sounds. So these guys see themselves making the shot every single time, conditioning their mind and body that it's perfect every time. They're not interrupted by a reality that would screw with them. So at the end of six weeks, they tally it up and now they give them a test to see who has the highest free throw percentage you know, success. What do you guess it's going to be? Well, the obvious person says, obviously, it's not the guys that didn't practice, but which one is it, the mind or is it the ones that actually practice? I'm assuming the mind. Yeah, you would assume it because it's true. Right. You intuitively know the truth, that practicing's not enough. It's getting yourself so certain so many times that now when you go to do it, there's no hesitancy and you execute. It's having that absolute certainty 
that makes you tap your full potential, take massive action, get massive results, be reinforced to have even stronger belief. This is what makes somebody a star at anything. It's like Jack Nicklaus, the golfer. Yes. He visualized every shot and where it was going, landing right where he wanted it before he ever hit it. Every single time. And what do every most golfers do? Time. They just take a practice swing and they kind of hope for the best and point in the right direction and hit it. And some of them, if they've had some bad hits, what are they really focusing on? You know, I don't what I do don't want to do. do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's the same thing here. So I'll show you a little stupid little physical technique for this. So stand up for a second. You guys going to do this the camera show? So try this for a second. So just put your feet together and then put your right index finger straight out in front of you like this. Okay? And all I want you to do is I want you to just turn clockwise comfortably as far as you normally turn. Just notice where you naturally stop. Go ahead and turn clockwise. People at home can do this too. Keep your feet straight. And notice where you stop. Come back around to me. Back around to me. Okay, good. Yeah, you're really good at this, right? <laughs> Drop your hand. Now let's do something really simple. Close your eyes, and you don't even have to visualize, just feel. I want you to imagine your finger coming back up again, and this time, see and feel it coming up. Don't actually make it happen, but feel like it's happening. Imagine in your mind that you're actually doing it. You're seeing it, you're feeling it, and then make it like a game where you turn twice as far this time. Like your little kid, you know, somebody measures you and you go, I'm taller, come on, measure me this week. And you, that desire to do a little further. And then in your mind, do it again. Your feet are straight together, and in your mind, feel your finger coming up, see it coming up, and imagine going three times as far this time. And then one more time, bring your finger up, and you're like an owl. Your feet are straight, and you turn all the way around, and it comes all the way around to the front. See it, and feel it, and enjoy it each time, like it's a game, like you can't wait to go further. And you know you do, every time. And then when you can feel that, and it feels good, then open your eyes, and now put your finger straight in front of you and turn as far as you can comfortably and see what happens this time. Go. Break my back. Now notice, I don't know if the camera's got it, but you don't even have to ask the camera. You can ask yourselves. Come back around. Did you go further this time, yes or no? A lot further. I think I went about 50% further. 50% further. Yeah, further. Yeah, How much further for you? About the same. Yeah. The average person will go 25% further. Now here's the question. We're superior. We're superior <laughs> pointers. There you go. We're superior you know, right finger pointers. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you have the potential to turn as far as you did the second time, the first time? Yes. Why didn't you? I didn't believe it, I guess. We have beliefs about stuff we don't even know we have beliefs. You have an unconscious belief about how far you can turn comfortably. The first time I did it, when I pointed straight back, yeah. I thought I, was, I probably shouldn't even go that far, like it was going to hurt me or that I, yeah. I wasn't capable of going any yeah. farther. So like, and how much further did you go this time? And the camera I knows it. over there. That's about exactly over there. right. Now, here's the difference. The potential was there the first time, and you took action and you got a result, but it was 50% less than what you did later on, and the only difference is they changed your belief. How did I change your belief? We didn't work harder on your potential, we didn't take more action. I got you to see the result in advance. I got you to see it vividly two or three times, that's all, of going further, and then your brain went, oh, I know what to do, boom, it went there. Isn't that what you did by looking at your cars every single day and envisioning it? I mean, isn't that what you did when you created whatever the vision was? It was $300, $2,500, a million bucks in a day? Yeah, that's, that's what's missing for these people. They're not getting that execution is everything, but it doesn't happen if you don't get the psychology set of a state of total certainty. And you, can, you just change that 50% in three minutes worth of visualization. And, and visualization is only one technique. Because I was like losing my balance with my eyes closed, but I was kind of like lopsided. So I got one good visualization in. The rest of the time I was like, I sure hope I don't fall down on camera with my eyes closed. It's going to look really <laughs> dumb. <laughs> You're going to have to do it. So you don't even have to be good at visualization. You can still get the improvement. So I want you to get, you know, you asked the question. What is that difference in people? This changes people's certainty. People are uncertain they're going to succeed. They want it, but they're afraid. The best way to deal with a fear is get a big enough reason that makes you have to succeed or condition yourself where you see it and feel it so often that you're certain that you just do it. That's all it really takes. That's awesome. awesome. You know, this worked. Uh, I was thinking this while you were talking about going to the Sit video down, store. Sit so we can hear, we hear this and we'll go. You were talking about uh, working in the video store and looking at the Porsches yeah. and stuff. I used to drive around in my car you know, doing the cold calling of the credit card machines and one way that I would avoid cold calling the pain of like cold calling and knocking on doors and everything would be to listen to your stuff and listen to Jim Rohn's stuff and wow. I would just drive around no particular desk just to listen to it okay. and strangely I still like to drive around I prefer to listen to that stuff in the car for some right. reason because it's, it's where you got imprinted <laughs> I guess I mean it's like well I'll just drive up and down the coast and check out the ocean you know yeah. so I would drive around and I would envision myself holding those types of seminars wow. and teaching people that kind of stuff. 
And three weeks ago, I was teaching a seminar in, in San Diego, and I was talking about beliefs and envisioning things, and I had to stop. And I shared with the audience, I was like, you're not going to believe this, but I actually used to envision this very moment wow. of me talking to you right now. So wow. it really, really works. Wow. Definitely works. Makes a difference, I'd say. I'll tell you what, I worked with Andre Agassi in 1993, I think it was. He'd been number one. He dropped to 32nd in the world. And he was ready, literally ready to quit with no exaggeration. His father was managing him and he was so angry with his life. And he, he went through some, I think, wrist surgery at the time. And he's working on his swing. And uh, he was dating Brooke Shields at that point. They weren't married, and not, not his current marriage, obviously. And so she said, you've got to come see Tony. She goes, I don't need motivation. He goes, he's not motivation, man. He's strategy. He'll show you how to make that shift in your head. So he comes. I work with the guy. In the beginning, he's saying, you know, do your magic stuff. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, great. Thank you. And I said, Tell me, I mean, you hit a tennis ball perfectly, and I'm trying to get him in the zone to remember that time, like you visioned, where he was perfect at it. He goes, of course I have, and I get him vision over and over again. And finally, he's in the zone. He's feeling that again, right? He's seeing it, and he's feeling certain, and the swing is going perfect. And I said, how's that feel? He goes, it feels perfect. I said, but are you thinking about the swing? You're not thinking about the swing. You're not thinking about how to do it. You're just seeing the result you want so vividly that it's there. So all he did was train him how to go in that state over and over again. He won the next weekend. The second weekend he came in second. Within six months, he was number one in the world again. And he gave me unbelievable credit. But all it was was conditioning the mind. You did it with tape, so did I. I the, we were just talking about this earlier, Pam and I. The, I used to go when I was 17 years old down in downtown Los Angeles, this place called Night Education, K-N-I-G-H-T, like in the night. I'd save up all my money, work as a janitor, and I would get these tapes and listen to these things over and over and over again. I went there for years, and I didn't have enough money, and I leveraged everything I had, but I knew how to train my mind. It's the one thing I knew how to do. The man's name was Mario. I saw him in his 80s. You know, he obviously knows how my life turned out and was very proud of the role he played in, in that process. He used to tell people the story. This guy's the real thing. He didn't just start out this way. This is how Tony did it. He listened to these tapes. He conditioned himself, right? This is the real stuff. He passed away a few years ago. I'm calling his house, and he passed away, and his, his, his daughter was there, and she wanted to share with me that how I touched his life and so forth. But the best thing was, I thought, you know what? I want to get those tapes. I want to get that stuff that conditioned. You know, I want to go back to that moment like you did of, you know, that moment was visualizing, now I'm living it. And she said, he left all this in his will to you. So I have all these tapes now wow. that are from the time when I originally went through, and like I'd go to sleep and I had these sleep tapes that conditioned my mind to believe that I could succeed even when I was sleeping or to build energy in my body. And anybody who wants to succeed has got to know it doesn't just happen. You can buy a product, but you also, with that product, have got to condition yourself. You've got to make it a must, and you've got to get a ritual. And if you do it, whatever you used to dream about you thought was so huge, you'll just live it. You'll live it like you lived this yesterday. Like We're all living the life that we envision because we had to and because we played this game with our head. We got the belief to be real by seeing it enough times and feeling it enough times to our brain believed it and then it made it happen. Which raised the potential, which made us take more action, which got us better results, which raised our beliefs again. That's right. And then that's why, that's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So instead of bitching about it, change it. And this is how you change It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's completely. It's pretty easy to change. Just that one simple exercise was amazing. I'm still like, holy crap, you know, I wonder what else I can do now. If but I look what most people do. Most people do the opposite of that, right? They get the product or they think about doing it, and what do they envision? It not working. That's yeah, right. the excuses that so they So they envision it not they working. As soon as they envision it not working, they feel uncertain. As soon as they feel uncertain, how much potential they tap? Little, if anything. Mm -hmm. And so they send back your product, and then you listen to the damn thing, you know? And guess what? What does that do, by the way? They make that as another lousy result in their life. I didn't even follow through on that, and they believe even less. This process is the holy grail. It's where the whole game changes, and anybody can do it, and they can do it in a few minutes, and if they do it a few minutes each day, then they get a different life. They do it a few minutes one time, their life changes for the day. It's, we're defined by our rituals. Everybody's got rituals, certain things they do every day, and what we three have in common, and anybody that I know of who has a life that they're living that was once a vision, is we saw it again and again and again, even when it didn't work, even when you lost 100 grand, even when I'm working as a janitor, there was something we would not give up on. And if somebody watching wants to change their life, they got to decide what they won't give up on and then put themselves in the state of momentum by a couple little rituals. That's and all it takes. And I think especially when it comes to anything related to making money, like making money products or promises or courses, people are so inundated with scams and all this garbage, yeah. true garbage, that you know their natural thinking is that they're so skeptical it's like they fall into the conditioning of, well, if anything's ever going to work, that thing has to prove it to me before I believe anything. So when they, f they go to approach the thing to make more money with, 
they're like, well, I'm starting at zero, and this thing has to prove to me that it has any potential at all before I believe that it will. Don't, don't you agree with that's the case? Unfortunately, it's the case, but here's the truth. When somebody says to me, in, in my business, even more, because a lot of people think I'm a motivator. Which I hate that term. That's never been what I've done. I do believe in energy, and I'm passionate. You know, they see 10,000 people in a room rocking. They go, oh, he's motivating them. I believe in peak state. You get a top athlete, you get in a concert, and you get in state, right? The problem is, to defend themselves so they won't be disappointed again, they lower their expectations. So someone will say to me, well, I'm skeptical or I'm pessimistic. And my response to them is, no, man, you're gutless. It takes no guts to be skeptical. You don't have to have any capacity to be a critic. And now with the web, you don't even have to own that you're the one being the critic. Eh? You can burn somebody and, you know, anonymously, right? I said, you know what? It takes guts to believe. And if you think something's going to do it for you without you putting your guts on the line, you might as well forget it right now. So this idea that I'm skeptical or they got to prove it to me, it's the biggest lie. What that really is is your fear talking. You're so scared of failing, you don't even want to get your hopes up. And if you don't get your hopes up, you might say, well, what if they get their hopes up and somebody gets disappointed? How many disappointments have we experienced in our business careers and in our lives? The difference is some people take disappointment and let it destroy them. Other people take disappointment and let it drive them. And you get to choose. Are you going to turn this thing into why it didn't work and a bunch of stories and excuses? Or are you going to take this thing that didn't work and figure out what are you going to do to make it work? And it may not happen the first time, the second time, the third time, but the people that are relentless find the way. And it's the common denominator in all these guys that are kind of our friends or family, you know, money masters, you know, new money masters is they all did it with will. Nobody here inherited this stuff. Everybody figured it out. Mm -hmm. And keep figuring it out. And it's going to keep changing. And you say, you know what, you know, 1% of, of 99% of the money being made is being made by 1% of the people because only 1% of the people will condition their mind and condition their body and follow through with some daily rituals. The rest will tell a story about why it didn't work, how it wasn't their fault. And you got, you got two things in life. You got results or you got a story, you know? And too many people think that that 1% is somehow entitled to it and they're not, which is, you know, it's just all in the head. It's, it's all, all in the head. Belief. It's all in the head, which can be changed with some conditioning basic condition. You just proved it yeah. to us. That's fun. That's why I made Get the Edge and Personal Power because I understood that from the very beginning. I could, originally it was 30 days and years later people would say, you know, I've heard all the great results and everything else, man, but you know, I don't have 30 days and I'd be behind the glass, you know, focus group, watching these people want to shake it, like, you don't have 30 days to change your life, you know? I thought, okay, I'll make it seven days, <laughs> you know? Just one, because after seven days, you get momentum. I mean, think about it. When do people's lives change? In a moment. It doesn't change in 10 years. Your life may have sucked for 10 years, but there's one moment when your life changes, the moment you decided. Mm -hmm. You said, no more, and I'm doing it, and you kicked yourself in the ass, and you made yourself go do something, right? When you finally said, enough, no more, I quit, or let's begin, or I love you, there's a moment when somebody's life changes. And that can be gotten in a couple of days. So people watching don't have to wait until they've mastered everything. They gotta get started and do what's next and just put themselves in a state where they start making some progress. Well, there it is. I think that's the answer that can help solve that problem with a lot of people. They'll just pay attention to it and, and do it. The bottom line is, you know, all three of us and some of the people that we consider as family that are part of this process, we've all done well. and We don't need to do this stuff. We're able to do this stuff because underneath it all, people can see in your eyes, Frank, when you talk about $2,500 you made that day <laughs> and the joy, right? Or you talking about not willing to settle, you know, and just I don't care what they say. They tell me I'm going to sit here and I should lower my expectations. I'm going to be driving my car in here and they're going to be delivering a video to me. There's something inside of every human being that will make it click that will make it so that today is not like yesterday and tomorrow will be different forever. And that process is an emotional hook. And what I hope is people watching this stuff, maybe something in here will piss them off enough or remind them of something or say there is a plan and it isn't just luck. And if I just get my big enough why and I get a little system for getting to conditioning myself and if I start to feel overwhelmed, I just do one next step and I keep learning and keep moving forward, I will get there. If we accomplish that out of this conversation, then this conversation was kick-ass and fun, not just for us, but it'll be something that we'll be really proud of a long time. Whether that happens or not really has nothing to do with us, but whether or not people take it in as real and do something with it. I hope they will. I that, think a lot that of people we can't will. Control. I think they will. Thanks a lot for meeting awesome. with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Interrupting appreciate your, your shoot here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go back yeah. to the next one. <laughs> go yeah. back to the next Thanks, one. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thank appreciate you. it. Really appreciate it.